grew up in Tanzania, you know, like from the humble beginning, people always use that word, like grew up with like with no shoes and then they end up coming into America. Welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am joined by another American. I seem to have quite a few Americans on my podcast, which I love. And today is Edward Mbishi, um, who is a CEO and founder of the Halen Super App. And he actually originally grew up in Africa and then moved to the US when he was 18, 19 years old. And he's got a fascinating story. We've just been hearing about his story before we started this podcast. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Deb. <laughs> oh, it's great to have you. Hey, look, you have got an interesting story because you started in tax of all things um, and yeah. then moved into limousine. So tell us a little bit about, about your story and where you've come from, where you are now. Um, do, do you want to go back like where I grew up or just? Yeah, just no, the please. Taxi? <laughs> no, let's do that. Let's get the, do the growing up too. That's great. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I grew up in Tanzania in a small village, like, you know, just... You know, like from the humble beginning, people always use that word, like uh, grew up with like with no shoes and then they end up coming into America. <laughs> uh, kind of weird story, like a whole culture shock. Um, so I went to college and end up start working. Oh, I actually ended up working for a company, the Blackberry. I don't know if you've, you've yes. ever heard of the Black. Yeah, I used to work for the, the company. <laughs> went out of business. It took me a while to run to get another job. That's how I end up stumbling into taxi. And I end up start working for uh, the tax company. It's a big tax company in Washington, D.C. Uh, as a dispatch, like a dispatch manager. Ah, yes. Uh, from there, uh, I end up getting a second job working for a limousine company. Uh, I was driving for them, then doing my dispatch. I go the tax morning. I go early in the morning, like 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 four thirty in the morning to like to like around like 1 32 p.m and then i go drive for the limousine so it was fun <laughs> <laughs> and, and from there i actually i end up i end up um learning a lot of the, the stuff in the industry uh how tax company works and also how limousines and i end up starting my own limousine company it was called dc private cars hmm. yep Okay. And mm -hmm. um, that you said to me in the podcast, also before we started talking, that that actually got sort of almost destroyed by the Uber app. Is that right? Yes. Yes. So the DC private car was very, it was good. I had it running for, for almost 15 years before Uber came in mm -hmm. and Uber came in. It was one of those, you know, like old school mentality we had. I was like, ah, nobody's going to order a limousine company using an app, <laughs> you know, <Yes. laughs> like, you know. <laughs> 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 like little we knew so but uh i realized when i start losing business like my my core customer where i will lose them where they, they will call me like hey pick me up at the airport and i'm like ah who took you to the airport because i'm normally the one who take them to the airport so i start losing those uh lost few other accounts like really good accounts and then i realized like hey i need to get out of this Mm -hmm. So I end up selling the company, uh, got out of really, like, I got lucky, I sold it and got out of it. And it took me about maybe two, almost, mm -hmm. almost two months, two years, two, not two months, two years <laughs> and a half, two years and a half trying to figure what I wanted to do. And uh, from there, I ended up developing a uh, ride share app. Uh, I wanted to design exactly the same thing what Uber was doing, but the little knowledge I had of technology, I ended up hiring some uh, some freelancer from India. They they designed the, the app for me. It worked actually perfectly fine, but and but I treated them just like a freelancer, right? They designed it, they left, and also with that old school mentality, I thought like we can design it like like you know like we used to do like. Uh, like old school, like you create a website, you put a phone number and email, you leave the website for two, three years before you update anything. Yep. But I was wrong. <laughs> Technology changes like almost like every second, whatever. But so the app got created and it ran for like almost six months. It was a really good app too. It ran for six months and start having a bunch of glitch problem with the code. And I trying to go back to find the same freelancer who designed it. Came to find that the guy I deal with, it was he was a project manager who find jobs and then find developers. He tried to find the developer, he could not get them. Either maybe he didn't pay them enough money, the money I paid him, <laughs> whatever reason. So we could not get the people that developed the app to fix it. So all this great shit was so much problem. So 
uh, we end up uh, uh, trying to find other developers. They looked at the code. They say, oh, the code has so many bugs. We cannot fix it. So what happened is now we just decide to abandon the whole thing. But even at that time, at that time, I was trying to reach out to investors who are like, oh, this is good. Uh, tell us more. Like, oh, do you have a CTO? Do you have a product manager? Do you have? I'm like, whoa. They ask me all this. So I'm like, I don't know. I don't have. I'm the only one who owned the company. So from there, I learned that I need to re, kind of regroup or pivot in a way, right? And kind of that from there, I started uh, recruiting a CTO, start recruiting team like system architecture, whatever. And from there. Uh, I learned even the CTO that I brought in, they looked at the code, they're like, whoa, this is too much mess. So we decided to leave that and then created a new company. But at the same time, actually, just for me to start learning exactly what's going on, I was I, I, I kind of registered driving for Uber and Lyft. <laughs> and just to be like, hey, what are, what are they doing good? What are they doing bad? For, for learning purpose, right? Yep. Uh, but a learning purpose, I kind of, end up kind of just kind of drifting in, in, in where uh, at the same time, it become like a, almost like a complaint where I, I would drive maybe 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And I look at my pay and I'm like, I didn't, I did not make enough money at all. Like, right. If you, you, you calculate from the, the, the either food, gas for your car, the wear and tear of your car, your time, and you end up looking at like, wow, I'm driving seven to seven and I'm making like nine dollars an hour. If you look wow. like, right, which <laughs> yeah. is hor Yeah, which is horrible, like where you cannot really save any money for either. Like, let's say when I had the limousine where you can be like, hey, I can take a vacation with my family for a week or two. I can put my kid in college. But this was like you can't take it even one week off because otherwise is like, you know, you, you will lose so much, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so from there, learning, uh, cursing one day, cursing on the, on the side of the highway, I'm like, this is impossible. I can't believe this is how much I made. I think I, think I, bought, I bought like a, like one of those, to like an electric toothbrush for like $80 and like one of those coconut water, like they come like in a box. Yeah. And and I remember I had lunch and I put gas in my car and the money was run out and I was left, I think, with like fifteen dollars. And I was like, for the whole day, like <laughs> and that, that really is really upsetting. But at the same time, I was learning uh, the way is uh, I had both Lyft and Uber. Right. Mm -hmm. So as I was driving, so I keep switching back on and off, on and off. Right. Because I want to stay busy and make enough money. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but at the same time, I was getting penalized by the system. Like why you keep turning on, turning off because they did not understand, Hey, I turned both apps, the Lyft and the, uh, the Uber and whoever give me a job, I turn off the other one. So I do the job. As soon as I drop off, I turn on the other one again. So whoever give me the job first, right. Mm -hmm. So in order to just stay busy. Right. Yep. But, uh, but I was getting penalized. So with that, I was not making enough. So I tried to add other apps so I can be, you know, if I have two apps now, maybe if I have four apps, it will keep me busy, right? So I register for Grubhub. I got, I got accepted and I got, I registered for Uber Eats. I got a declined. And I'm like, why did I get declined if Uber Eats is owned by Uber and I drive for Uber? Right. So I saw the disconnection there. I'm like, why would you decline me if you already, you know, I already worked for your other company. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, from there, now I had three apps. I had I have uh, Uber, Lyft and I have Grubhub. So now I'm turning three apps. <laughs> if we, on and off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. On and off, on and off. And, and I did a couple of times where you accept the job. And I forget to turn off the other one and I'll be driving and a day will pop up. You have a job with this. I'm like, oh, I'm on another job. And then you got to decline. And every time you decline, also you get penalized. Mm -hmm. So by the, by the app that you're declining, right? So it's like they're almost kind of penalizing you and they push you to the bottom where you're not going to be receiving more job quick. From there, it was just a headache, right? 
it's like turning off, turning off, turning off. So you just a headache with all those apps. And I would, from there, also I'm still putting my team together for this new Helen Super app. Um, I realized why not merge two services where you have food delivery and ride share together and the driver can decide whatever, you know, they can decide if they want to do both. They just like assume they drop off person. They want to pick up food. They can pick up food. Uh, from there, learning slowly, this, this idea of a super app, I never heard of it, right? And, and in my head, I start realizing, like trying to learn more trying to kind of understand why, if you can combine this stuff, why hasn't, hasn't this big company done it, like Uber or Lyft? And as, I'm, as I was learning, like it became clear that whenever you design an app, you need to design a system architecture, right? Mm -hmm. The system architecture is like a house foundation, right? A house foundation, if you say, hey, I'm going to build a four bedroom house, right? You cannot turn around Maybe a year later, you know what? I'm gonna put a high rise on top of it, right? Mm -hmm. yep. The fun, right? The, the foundation is not gonna help. It's not gonna support the high rise because it's only support a four bedroom house. So system architecture is the same. Like these companies, uh, they are big. They spend millions of dollars to build their system, but their system only support that that foundation of a one bedroom of, of a four bedroom house, not a high rise. Mm -hmm. So we came in with Uber. Um, we came in with like when I was putting the team together. We came in with the, with this idea of Helen. We start learning like oh, super app. They are very popular in other countries like Asia market or Middle East or whatever. Uh, so you so can for the, for the listeners app. listening in, can you just explain to me your you know what is a super app? How would you describe a super app? <laughs> um, without reading. Uh, Wikipedia, ex <laughs> Wikipedia <laughs> explanation. A super app is a one platform that allow customer or um, or the public to access multiple services. So it is is a one stop shop app, mm -hmm. kind of like where you have a bunch of different apps. So it like the way we have ours, the Helen we have. We have six different uh, services where we have we have ride share, we have grocery delivery, we have uh, restaurant delivery, we have retail delivery, then we have flight booking, and we have vacation rental. But some uh, some other super app, they can go. You can go with super app anything like whatever you do. You can be like, hey, I want to have ride share, I want to have uh, grocery, I want to have banking, I want to have insurance, I want to have a barber shop, whatever. You as long this system can accept multiple service to do multiple service in one app. Mm -hmm. So it helps uh, consumer or customer not to end up like, let's say to, to, to use one app on, a, on the, all their dairy use, right? Without them uh, exposing their personal data or personal information, get tracked their, uh, their movement of whatever their history with a bunch of different apps. You have one, the super app is one app, you enter your credit card information and your, person, your personal information on one app where you don't have to download so many other apps where you have to, to enter your personal information again, put password, put, so now you have like multiple apps listening to your tracking or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. The super app saves you with all that noise, it cut off all, uh, it helps you. So it's like, I would say a super app is something that provide privacy and security. Maybe the simple way for me to say it, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. cool. So you've been developing this super app now, and I suppose um, you've had some learnings. You've already shared some of them from the original Rideshare app. You, you've talked a little bit about people and, you know, making yeah. sure that you have the right people. That's one of the learnings that you had. Tell us a little bit about what you've learned and, and how you're dealing with that now. Oh, this, this is fun. I thought, I thought I had a lot of the management skills like when I had a limousine company. Mm -hmm. This is way totally different. Like, because when I had the limousine company, I had a small of customer service, like four people and right. we knew each other. They're like, kind of like, I knew their behavior and everything fine. It's like, they know it. they come in, they answer phone, they help driver. That's fine. And also for driver, 
driver did not stay in the office. They came in, pick up the car, or some of them, they kept the car at home. They just deliver, they drive, whatever, and they will come back to the office maybe once a day or once every week, whatever. Mm-hmm. With, we're putting a team together um, to work on this where you are communicating with people like every day or just kind of just just find like going to learning people like from the progress of the app right like hey mm-hmm. we're doing this we're doing this and also we have a lot of virtual meetings and all this it's a lot of stuff that i end up learning like human behavior right yeah it's it's almost um in a way i don't know how to say this it's like because you're dealing with so many different multiple like personality and each individual is motivated differently right with the with the new age now people is like they almost like um what do you say people are not long time ago uh people used to look for job that is like hey i find a job this is my job is this is my future it's gonna give me my future or whatever mm-hmm. people now is like hey no uh it's about my feelings <laughs> how am i being treated right <laughs> yeah. so i don't care if they give me a bunch of money it's about my feelings, right? So you find you're trying to find the, the balance between uh, getting to know the person, trying to know the people. Like what are what are they motivated? Are they motivated by money? Are they motivated by the title? Are they motivated by both? Are they motivated by they want to learn about something about this project? Maybe it's because they, some of them they just want to come learn. And then it becomes that stepping, you know, kind of like something for them to push them to the next level, right? Mm-hmm. So, but also at the same time, it's like you, you're trying to figure, it's like a very thin line where you're like, I'm trying to get to know them, but am I violating their privacy? <laughs> so it's like, it's like, it's a very delicate thing, kind of like trying to, to deal with people or trying to learn or like, in, like bringing people to your team. Yeah. So, so how do you kind of look for that right person to join your team? Um, so now it becomes, um, you, you kind of look, I, I do a lot of uh, dealing with people through LinkedIn, right? Mm-hmm. I hire through LinkedIn or I deal with people from LinkedIn. Um, so I talk to people and there are some, you can never really get a hundred percent. Because sometimes you're looking, you're looking for, I call like symptoms. <laughs> you're looking for like, is this person going to be a good fit for my team? How do they communicate? Does it take them uh, six days to respond? Does it take them one hour to respond? Does it, you know, so things like that can be red flag. Like someone who, like, let's say you see them on either on LinkedIn posting because you're connecting, you see them like, hey, for the past three days, they have posted like four times, yeah. but they have not responded to my message on LinkedIn or my email. So you're like, that's a red flag, right? You're like, okay, yeah. this person is not probably a good fit. Um, so with the, with also the way things now, the way have uh, have been is like a lot of the stuff are remote, right? Remotely, where people you're working either just they're working from home and and like people working from home, it become tricky also because. Sometimes people might end up abusing the system where they're like, they have your job, but also they are doing other jobs, either freelancing or they are starting their own business. So really this person, is this person going to focus on your project or are they going to be distracted doing some other stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So, so it's, it's a very tricky way trying to find the right individual. But once in a while you get, you get like really dedicated, like let's say, Let's say you get you you hire five people, right? Out of five people, probably you gotta get two that you got it like right the, the right way, and the other three probably like hey, I missed it. Then you gotta start over, kind of thing. So yeah. Okay. Um, I know that with your current sort of project, you your how many staff do you have in in the um, current project at the moment? So so far, I have four total plus twelve developer overseas. Right. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so I know that you've been sort of trying to raise funds and things and you, you've become quite good at raising funds from um, investors. Tell us a yes. little about, you know, what you've had to do to get that. And also you, you mentioned <laughs> when we first spoke about those, uh, you have um, a board of advisors as well. So tell yes. me a little bit about both of those, if you wouldn't mind. 
Okay. Um, so we, we start with the Board of Advisors. So Board of Advisors, um, it's, it's, a great, it's a great idea to find Board of Advisor, right? But I also had the Board of Advisor. I did find Board of Advisor through LinkedIn. And mm-hmm. then from LinkedIn, I was able to use some of the Board of Advisor to, to find, to connect me with people that they know that can bring value to, to the company for advising and stuff. So one of the, the, the tricky thing is when you post a job posting and you say you're looking for Board of Advisor, Everyone love the title of board of advisor. They love it. Like everyone want to be called a board of advisor. There's some of them, they don't know what they entail being a board of advisor. They just want to have that board of advisor to either to uh, something that can help them in their journey or whatever, whatever career, like they want to, it's almost kind of goes like on their resume, right? Yeah. So if it goes in their resume, it looks good for them for whatever reason they are looking for. Either they are looking to apply for a bigger job or, uh, and it's, 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 very, it's very strange too, because when you're looking for board of advisor, you can get someone who's very qualified. You're like, oh, this person is perfect. But what I would suggest for someone, if you're looking for board of advisor, you, you like, let's say you, because you have to look at each, like my startup when I was doing, I had to look for, for multiple positions. Like I would have to look, I had to look for franchise person, someone who knows franchise because our yeah. company is involved in franchise. I had to look for someone technology, AI. I had to look for someone finance. I had to look for someone human capital. So you look at this positions like whenever you're looking at like one of the things that you have to be very careful is that people i call them title grabbers title grabbers are people like they apply for you they want to be board of advisor and you open their profile on linkedin and you see they have like 10 12 jobs and all jobs that current like from 2022, from 2021 they are still working with the same company this day and i'm like you have 10, 12 jobs, exactly what are you doing at those jobs? So those are kind of people I stay away from, right? right. I stay, mm-hmm. I'm trying to stay away from people like that where they have so many jobs, this, that, this. And that because that time, then I'm like, wow, this person is more like title grabbing person, just want to have their title. Kind of, anyway. And the other thing that helped me also looking for a uh, board of advisors because I was on a fundraising uh, model, we still fundraising. I was able to, to get a board of advisor. I was like, hey, you want to be a board of advisor? We are fundraising. So for you to be a board of advisor, we need at least 2,500 to be an investor into the company. So you can be, you know, so we know like in, in a way, kind of like to validate the, 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 the idea, right? Mm-hmm. To see someone, if you want to board, if you want to be a board of advisor for this company and you believe in this company, do you believe also with $2,500, right? Yep. Because sometimes people are like, no, 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 I don't have the money now. It's like, oh, I cannot invest in this company, right? I'll be like, so why do you want to be a board of advisor in a company that you cannot invest in, right? Yep. For someone who want to be a board of advisor, you have to make sure they understand the vision of your company. They understand the vision of what you're trying to really do and really can be a good, element for your company to give you really good advice right yeah so you're, and, you're looking for people on the board that can fill some of the skill gaps that you've got um, to ensure that you've got a really rounded diverse yeah board for making i suppose informed decisions yeah exactly exactly these are the people that have extensive experience in their industry they help you i always say block any uh, blind spot like let's mm-hmm. say something like i don't know much about maybe uh, franchise. So I will find someone who knows about franchise, who's a board of advisors, knows about franchise. I look for someone who knows about HR, like human resources. I, so I find a, a board who's a, a human capital. And I go to another one, maybe marketing. I will find someone who, who has experience in marketing. So in a way, I mean, don't, don't, if you're looking for this board, don't get, don't really take it away the way I did because I wasn't, I was in the fundraising mode. So I, I wanted to leverage that. Hey, if you want to be an invest, if you want to be a board, you also has to invest. And also if you look at it, there are some companies that help people to put on a board 
or, you know, you become a board of, on a, of a company, right? Yeah. But those company, they charge you to become, so they can connect you. So, and I'm thinking if they're going to charge you to connect you to, to, to be a board of a company, why not just pay the company directly as an investor? Also, you, you get equity out of it. So, but that's the way I did. But for someone else who's trying to put a board of advisor, look for, you, you don't have to, to get them a, to be an investor in a company. Just look for, for people who has experience, but also find people who are responsive. Like you don't want to get a board of advice just because they just want the title. You want to get someone who's going to be responsive. Like if you send them an email or a text, you want to hear them at least maybe 12 hours at least minimum is good. Because when you're, when you're a founder uh, for a startup, um, you want quick re response. Yeah. Like, because your head is bouncing all over the place. You want a quick response. So you need to find people that can respond really fast for you to move on to other thing or to, you know, to close whatever issue you have. Uh, that's what I would suggest probably. Cool. Um, and, and so and do you, do you meet with your board of advisors as a team or do you use them individually as and when needed in terms of, if you need some help with the franchise, you go directly to that um, advisor board member, or how do you, how do you run your board of advisors? Yes. So this is an individual. So like uh, we have the meeting, we have the meeting every, actually every, every, every two months, we have a meeting all together with the progress report and everything what's mm -hmm. going on. But whenever I have problem, I deal with, with them individually. So yeah. I have a problem for franchise. I call the franchise board of advice. I have a problem, maybe hiring someone or I'm, I need advice on hiring someone. I talk to the human resources. I have this question. I have uh, maybe like the, I had an, an interview. Uh, it was an article that got published like, like last week. Uh, it was about super app and technology and AI. I call, I had to use also my AI uh, board of advisors to be also used at the court. So it's, you use them individually. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about fundraising. Cause I know that you know, I, I used to work with the ice house, which is a big incubator over here in New Zealand. And, you know, uh, we'd have people coming with ideas and of course they all thought they could raise millions of dollars and, and, you know, not every idea is a great idea. And sometimes yeah. you actually have to sanity check it and go, mm, is this really, you know, where's the market validation that shows it's a good idea. But if it, yeah. even if it was a good idea, I know that fundraising is always top of mind, particularly when you're developing app software, um, that mm -hmm. kind of product. So tell me a little bit about your fundraising efforts and what you've learned from that. Yes. So fundraising is, is really weird thing. So it's one of those weird things because you have, you have people, you're always like looking for someone who's think like almost like outside the box. Right. Mm -hmm. So for my startup, I'm more like of, of like, I'm looking, I'm on the angels, angel, uh, what do you call it? angel investors stage. Yes, like where where um I have spoken to venture capital, but I'm I'm more of an angel angel uh, investors kind of looking if think, for. Like, if you think about the pathway, you know, if just the people listening, yeah. you know, the, the first thing is usually um the three Fs: family, friends, and fools. The next yes, thing yes. is angel investors, and that's people yes. who are actually putting in their their own money, but they have an active interest in the business. And venture capitalists generally come later stage when you've actually got a company that's up and running um, that that needs capital to take it to the next level. So, yeah, so you're at the angel investor stage. I hear that. Yes, yes, yeah, good. So with angel investors. Uh, it's very weird now because even them, they are, I think a lot of the time, a lot of them, they kind of, kind of got pushed up into the cryptocurrency, right? Mm -hmm. So they jumped into cryptocurrency because this thing was everybody talking cryptocurrency, FT, NFTs, and yeah. uh, everybody kind of running over there, uh, ICO, whatever. They got burned, right? Mm -hmm. So once they got burned, now they are coming back to normal fundraising where people are, are doing like, you know, technology company or this company. So now angel investor are acting very like weird, almost like a, like a venture capital, mm -hmm. like where they are asking too much questions, like where they are like, Oh, do you have traction? Do you have, you know, do you have this? Do you have revenue? Do you have, and you're like, Whoa, angel investor, nobody that will invest on a, on an idea on a napkin. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> you explain to them what you do. So now it's like, so it become a little bit difficult now fundraising, but they are listening. And a lot of the time, sometime when you're pitching an angel investor um, or venture capital, they, they start looking at things like, oh, 
who's your competition? What is the market, right? How big is the market and all that stuff. And so for us, we're like, hey, the market is humongous, right? Mm -hmm. And we explain to them, they're like, oh, yeah, you're right. And then they go in the mode like, wait, if if it's humongous, why this competitor that out there are not doing? Then you're trying to explain to them because this, this thing that we're doing is so new for them. It's like we're creating a new space, mm. but it's like for them to, to understand it. Few of them are understanding it, but for them, they are like, oh, wait, we want to wait for you to see like attraction a little bit. Once you finish the system, go into the market, then we want to hear. Plus one other thing also we are, we are running into, uh, we had one, one investor like, do you have an office in San Francisco in Silicon Valley? I'm like, no, uh, we, we are DC based. And I'm like, oh, if you guys were in San Francisco, probably you were. I'm like, does it matter? A technology company does not have to be in San Francisco. And it can start from anywhere. So a uh, few things that we are facing, we are, we are um, right now we actually, we just, we just, we about to launch a tokenization, uh, a security uh, token offering, which, which is way better than the ICO because the, the security, uh, security uh, token is more attached to the company equity. Mm -hmm. And we are launching that uh, in next week by the October 1st. Yeah. So de dealing with investor is, I would say for now, I'm more focused on finishing the product. Yeah. So because for them, I wanted them, I have, I have finished the MVP, yeah. but I want to finish the product by bootstrapping because of them. And of course, right now we're going through like recession or whatever you call this kind of like going where everybody's very tight on money. So we're going to finish the fourth service where we'll have the right share, grocery delivery, retail, and, and, uh, <laughs> and food delivery. Yep. So from there, I want to go back to them. I'm like, hey, guys, here's the system. It's developed. I have everything complete. And also, I'm going to be able to start onboarding drivers. Mm. And for them, I can show them to that. I'm like, hey, this is the system done. And I have this much drive already registered because to, to get drive is going to be very easy. So that's what I'm focused now. But, but I have learned a lot. And a lot of investors, almost all of them, they use the same script. Like yeah. as soon as you get in there, they're like, uh, do you have traction? Do you have this? Do you? So it's like all of them, they are using, almost they are reading the same script back and back. So and it's, it's probably I would say I have gotten warm introduction where someone introduced me to an investor and the investor, they're like, oh, this is good. And actually that investor was very good because they stopped they start putting themselves in the company. They're like, oh, we can do this. We can do this. Mm -hmm. When you, you hear an investor saying that, that means it's really good. So that investor was like, oh, this is good. We can do this. And also the franchise can do this. And they're like, yes, that's your right there. And then he was like, okay, listen, as soon as you guys launch, talk to me. <laughs> and we're, like, no, we, <laughs> we're like, no, we need the money now. But, but so now uh, we raised so far about 200000 Yep. And uh, we have been awarded a million dollar by a tech company. But when you, when you get a million dollar from a tech company, what they are trying to say is if your system is going to cost $2 million, yep. you only give us a million dollar and the other million, we're going to take an equity. So it's like you're trading equity for that million, whatever. So we got awarded for that, which is, which is big deal. Also it's not, it's not handed to us, but it's big deal in uh for the company itself to say hey we're gonna take a million dollar equity in in the exchange right for work yep and and also we have been awarded by google for startup a hundred thousand k nice. so th yeah that's that's good so that means they see the potential so uh right now we're just just kind of focusing to have this team um kind of just kind of bootstrapping so we can finish and then kind of go back and and then kind of hopefully uh reach start launch the company and also start maybe reaching out to venture capital. Sure. 
and I think if I heard you right, and, and I've seen this when I was working at the Ice House too. So when you're looking for investment, it's really important that you you have done your homework, you've got your yeah. numbers, you can show you've got some traction, even yeah. if it's not you know necessarily paying customers. You need to be able to show people are actually starting to um, take up your MVP and, and show that sort of growth for them, and just be be really prepared to answer the questions because they are starting to get tougher around what they will or won't invest in. So mm-hmm. you need to have your you know your numbers and your story and your understanding of your environment really strong so they know that you are serious about it yeah yes yes so the most important thing so like so one other thing i think sometime we, we we for my company itself the way we we hit some some wall because people they're they're looking at it like they're like whoa this is way too big because they don't understand the concept much of a super app because this is the first super app that they will be exposed to so they don't understand and even if you look at other company, even when they started this competitor like Uber Lyft, when they said, hey, we're going to have people ordering cars on the app, a lot of investors, they're like, yeah, that's a crazy idea. Or like Airbnb, they're like, hey, we're going to have people rent people's house. I'm like, whoa, stranger, <laughs> live, staying in people's house? That's, you know, nobody is like, you know, when you when you have guests come into your house, the you first thing you up. do, you go, you go close your bedroom door, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now you're going to rent the the whole house so like the things sounded crazy because that was new to people now this super app is new uh people it scares them they're like whoa so but until we create that uh we have you yeah you're right you have to be ready you have to have your pitch deck your your financial projection your your whole number you have to have everything like uh you to go to market and competitive analysis, all that thing that's all there. Exactly. And, I, and I think that makes good business sense anyway for any startup yeah. to actually have that stuff there. The thing I learned too about investors from working at the Ice House was that um, they tend to like to invest close to where they live, which is part of yeah. that San Francisco story. It's like yeah. actually, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I found with the American investors, particularly, they were very much more inclined to invest if that company was in the same state as, as they were in. Um, exactly. And the same with New Zealand yeah. investors. So you'll be very careful. It's like, yeah. You don't have to move to San Francisco, but yeah. there are certainly a lot more investors in San Francisco. Hey, I'm conscious of time. We've, we've been talking for a while. Now. It's been really interesting, but we're running out of time. I'd love to just finish off with your, you know, your three top tips that we could give to people listening into the podcast and, and then finishing up with you know where they can get hold of you. So what would be your three top tips, would you say? For 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 you, this is for founders and, and startup and CEO, yeah. right? Yeah. The, the first thing is probably if you now if you have not heard of this. Get some sleep. Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> One of the things you need to get your sleep uh, because I know sometimes sleep can be really um, like where you like you you're working so hard on your idea and you're stressing yourself. So you you feel like uh, even you you go to sleep and three in the morning you get up trying to work on your idea. No. So I would say get some sleep. Yeah. Trying to trying to exercise and the exercise I would say even if walking walking for like two miles a day mm-hmm. and without, without a uh, headphone, without <laughs> listening to anything, don't listen to music. Don't listen to, to any podcast or whatever. Just, just let your mind wander. Yeah. I would say that would be the second one to, to, uh, to do that. And then the third one, I would say, uh, listen to podcasts like this, the business ideas, Mm-hmm. Uh, listen to some other, you know, about business, you know, you can learn a lot of stuff from podcasts like this. And the other thing, like read some book, if you're able to read some book, um, I grabbed this book, uh, this book, if we can see uh, it. Yeah, Eric Reese, the Lean Startup, one of my yes. favorites. Yep. Yeah. And that, ah, okay. Uh, How uh, I Built This by Guy Raz. I've not seen that yep. one. So that's, yep. yeah, but the Lean Startup's a fantastic book. Um, I shall have to yes. get hold of the other one. Yeah. Yes. They are really good books. So, yeah, I would say the first thing, sleep. Get some sleep, trying to, trying to get eight hours. I know it's not going to be, but at least even if you don't get eight hours, trying to sleep maybe four hours when you wake up and then try to take a nap yeah. <laughs> as long as you're getting enough sleep. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, first of all, your, your brain needs to be in a, in a space where it can actually deal with things. And when you're exhausted, it just can't work. And, yep. and the exercise thing is also really important. I mean, that we call it a clarity break is not having any distractions going out there without the headphones, but just yep. being out in nature, being out, taking a walk, um, yep. yeah, having a bit of a clarity break to allow your brain time to rest so that it can come back and, and serve you better, if you like. <laughs> 
And if you, I will suggest the last thing is if you have enough funding, yep. travel, just travel. go somewhere, travel, be in a different city. Mm -hmm. That also helps you really to open up. So you'll like kind of, I don't know why, but it works for me. Like if I go somewhere, I'm like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> <You're an environment. laughs> Love it. Yeah, yeah. Hey, look, so if people would like to find out more, Edward, how would they get hold of you? I'm on uh, LinkedIn. If you search for Edward Mbeche, uh, or you can search Helen Super App. Helen is with the A-A. So H-A-L-E-N. Yep. Yep. Super App. And you should be able to find us and you'll be able to connect with us. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, look, thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom with us. Really appreciate it. Um, good luck with everything. I shall follow with interest and uh, we'll, we'll hopefully catch up in sort of six months times and see where you're at. Yeah. Thank you so much, Deborah. Again, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Thank you.